He says it starts hard when it's cold, but it's okay when it's warmed up. I know nothing about this car. He knows nothing. He just bought it. So let's start to figure why doesn't it start up right away. So we'll open the hood. Check to see if anything obvious is worn out. We'll start with the air filter. You wouldn't believe how many times I found cars are running bad because the air filters were all clogged up. But in this case, perfectly clean, nothing wrong with that. So what about spark plugs? This has well over 100,000 miles. We'll check them. So we'll take the 10 millimeter covers off. These dumb beauty covers, they drive me nuts. Get them all the way off. They didn't make them too long, so they're a pain in the ass to take apart. Off it comes. Pull out the number one spark plug. We gotta take the 10 millimeter bolt off the ignition coil. Squeeze this so the electrical contact comes off and pull it off. Then we get a socket, stick it in, and take out the spark plug. Out it comes. And as you can see, baby got a lot of crud on it. It's flat, worn out. Now not only is it worn out, but when you look closely, it's covered with burnt stuff. That's burnt oil. This engine burns oil. This was not a good choice for the customer. Maybe it'll last a while, but the engine's burning oil. The previous owners did not take care of it. So we're gonna put new spark plugs in. If that makes it start cold, great. Fantastic. But if not, odds are it's just gonna have to live with that as long as it runs, because a worn out engine, when it's cold, will always start up hard, but then when it's warmed up, it'll start up okay. So let's pray the spark plugs fix. So I'm gonna put new spark plugs in, but this is a great lesson. If you only remember one thing when you're buying a used car, take out at least one spark plug. Look at it. If it's covered with burnt oil pieces, carbon, don't buy the car. It means the engine's burning oil. Why mess with it? It's somebody else's problem. Don't make it yours. Now this is a Toyota Corolla. They can run years and years still burning oil. You'll have to add oil, change the spark plugs more often. Eventually, you might have to change the catalytic converter, but they can still run, only you don't want to get involved in that in the first place. So now we'll change out the four spark plugs. You just put them in so they're snug. Once you get them snug, get them tight. And then a little, little bit of turn. That's snug enough. And of course, change all four. Then we'll see what shape the engine is. Are they all burning oil? Or only some of them. Well, it looks like it's gonna be all of them. The second one's burning a lot of oil too. Bad news. As is the third one and the fourth one. Previous owner or owners of this car did not change the oil frequently enough. Now the engine's worn. The new plug should make it run better. Just gonna have to add oil as it burns and see how long it lasts. Well, now we got the spark plugs in. Let's see how it starts up when it's cold. Well, it starts up better than it did, but you can hear the engine clacking. That shows it's worn internally. You're just gonna have to live with that. Now, truthfully, if you would've brought me this car to buy, I would've checked the plugs, listened to the engine, I would've said, don't buy it. Especially not for the $3,000 he paid. If you wanted to buy it for a thousand bucks, go ahead. But three is too much for a car with all this wear. And I had just begun to check into it. I might find a lot of other things wrong. I'll take it for a quick spin. Start it up again. You see, now it starts fine because it's already started up. And as we drive down the road, I'm also hearing something that's not good. Hear that roaring noise. We'll go faster and you'll hear it better. As we let lows. You can hear that woo woo woo. That means the front wheel bearings are going out too. This is a front wheel drive car. Pretty expensive job. Now as I drive it around, I can tell both front wheel bearings are worn. It's a very expensive job, but I've seen people drive these things for years that way. I would hold off on that until it has actual play and then it doesn't steer right. It's steering perfectly fine. And with all the things that are wrong with this car, I wouldn't throw that kind of money into it now. I might even try to sell it on and get rid of it if I was the person who purchased this car. Because when I'm done, it'll start and run pretty good. The AC blows cold. Might not be a bad idea to just get rid of this thing. Now, if you've I learned two things from this video. The first one is, pull out a spark plug on any used car you're gonna buy, and if it's covered with burnt carbon, don't buy the car. And two, don't buy the car, then bring it to a mechanic like me to check out after you've already purchased the thing. That's the old saying, don't put the cart before the horse. Horses are great at pulling carts when you harness them up, but they're no good at pushing them from the back. 
<laughs> you do things backwards, bad things can happen. And that's why I tell people always have a real mechanic like myself. Check out a used car before you buy it. There are too many things that can go wrong. And don't be penny wise and pound foolish. Don't say, oh, I'm not gonna pay the mechanic $100. I can check it out myself. Uh. <laughs> it's worth paying them a hundred bucks. It can save you from nightmares. And at the least, it can save you from paying too much. Okay, paid three grand for this thing, right? I would have given maybe $1,000 for it, realizing that it's gonna need all this work in the future. It burns oil, yada, yada. But it is a Corolla, and they can run for years and years and years. But $3,000 for an engine that burns oil, front wheel bearings need replacing. We know the catalytic converter is going to have carbon, and eventually that's going to need replacing. There's a lot of expense that I could see down the line with this car. So, hey, if you paid a thousand bucks for it, so what if you had to put a couple thousand in in the next three or four years? But if you paid three and you had to put in, then you would have put $5,000 into a car that's worth two or three tops. Now, of course, there's one flaw in my thinking there. You gotta find a guy like me. <laughs> there aren't that many honest mechanics left anymore. A lot of mechanics will check out a used car for you and they're adding it up in their head. Let's see, in the next four years, I can make a couple thousand dollars off this guy. I'll tell him to buy the car. I'm not that way. I've actually lost customers over the years because I told them their cars were junkers because they were. And they got mad at me because they bought a junker car. <laughs> hey. I'm logical about it. I just tell the truth about it. My grandfather was the same way. I remember when I was going to high school and I was a young mechanic. Father's gas station. My grandfather was the chief mechanic. Used to have a fish truck come by in July. They buy gas, right? My grandfather came up and he said, Ooh, wait, does this truck stink? And it did stink a dead fish. There was no arguing that, right? The guy who ran the company, oh, he wouldn't come by anymore because he felt insulted. His truck stunk. That's the way it is. And in the case of this Toyota Corolla, it's a nice looking car, right? The inside's in decent shape. Sure, it's got some bird poo on the back, but you know, it's a decent looking car. That's what fooled the guy into buying it. He did not check the mechanics of it. Sure, it's a Toyota Corolla. You know, people call them bulletproof. Well, no machine is totally bulletproof. If you don't change the oil like the previous owners on this didn't, it's gonna wear the engine. I had a customer with one. He didn't change the oil thing until he had 80,000 miles on it. And I said, didn't you change it once? He said, nah. And he said, hey, it ran good. I didn't care. Doesn't it burn oil? He says, you know, the first 65,000 miles, it didn't burn any oil. But now I got to put a quart of oil on every thousand miles or so. But he said, oil's cheap. What do I care? No, when it got to 110,000 miles on it, it was starting to run bad. The engine was really worn out. And he was a bit of a tactless person, being a salesman. So... He sold it as a cash car to a guy. And the guy thought that it only had 15,000 miles because it was an old one when it went to 99,999, right? So he totally ripped that guy off. The guy figured it out later when his mechanic says, hey, this thing doesn't have 15,000, it's got a lot more. Even though the thing was only two years old, he passed his problem on to somebody else. Even though it was a Toyota, everything will break down if it isn't taken care of. That's why you pay a mechanic to check it out. And I mean a real checkout. Not some guy that says, I check him out for free and he spends 10 minutes, drives around, says it's a good car. No, pay a guy like me about a hundred bucks to do a bunch of tests, do computer scans, see what kind of shape the vehicle is in, and then give a true analysis of, here's what's wrong, here's what's not wrong, here's what it's really worth, and go from there. Don't just buy it without a mechanic looking at it, unless you happen to be a mechanic yourself, because even a vaunted Toyota Corolla that looks as good as this one does and has freezing cold air conditioning in it can have a lot of problems in it when it gets to be really high mileage if the previous owner or owners did not take care of it. And from my experience, a lot of people with Toyotas, they're so spoiled with the cars not breaking that they never check anything. I had a customer six months ago almost blew the engine up in her car. She had changed the oil in my Corolla. I changed it like half a quart of oil came out. And I said, gee, you know, you're burning oil, do you check it? Oh, well, I had it changed last June, she said. She never even checked it. Well, it was burning oil now. She didn't add it, almost destroyed the engine. Even Toyotas need tender care every once in a while. So if you're buying a used one, don't you say, oh yeah, it's a Toyota Corolla, great, I'll buy it. There are good mechanics out there. And honest ones like myself, we don't spend a nickel advertising because we got more business than we can handle. So ask your friends, look around, find an honest mechanic who knows cars, who's gonna tell you the truth and not tell you to buy some used car that he's gonna make a lot of money, but be honest and have a lifetime customer.
Now in the case of this Mercury Grand Marquis, the coolant is leaking down the front where the radiator is. So, we'll take this plastic shield out of the way. Then we'll get a flashlight and start looking around. Realize the radiators are made out of aluminum, even they're called plastic radiators because they have plastic ends. And as we look around, we can see there it's leaking. And right there, somebody attempt to fix it using epoxy. But the epoxy didn't work and it's leaking all over the place. From my experience, it's a complete waste of time trying to fix a plastic radiator and here's why. 21 years old. The plastic gets brittle. If it cracks and you fix a crack, the whole thing's brittle. It's going to crack somewhere else or the brittle plastic might not even hold the epoxy. So when it's broken like this, just replace it. But it's not as bad as you might think. My customer bought a brand new radiator for it. Now this brand new radiator only cost 119 bucks at a discount auto parts store. They're made out of plastic and aluminum. They're cheap to make. You can buy Chinese ones, no problem, as long as they fit. Like I said, made in China, doesn't matter, as long as it fits. Now changing the radiator isn't that bad. You gotta take all the plastic junk off, bolt it to the radiator first. So we'll take the overflow tank off. There we go, but this is in the way, so we gotta take the mount off too. So we'll remove the radiator mount, happens to be the same size bolt. Off comes the mount, then we get to the little spring. That holds the tank on. It's kind of a pain, so we'll take the top one off instead. It's easier to get to. So we'll wiggle it some more and see if we can get it off. There, now that's off. You can reach behind where the overflow tank is. You can unbolt the cowling for the fan. One on this side and one on that side. And while we're at it, we'll kick the drain pan under here and disconnect the upper radiator hose. Now I use a special tool for that. It's a clamp remover. It's a lot easier than using pliers. Pliers often slip. These don't. You just clamp them so they're real tight. Then the clamp will slide off. We can leave it on and then pull the hose off. And off goes the hose. We'll move it out of the way. Then we can take the other bolt off that holds the radiator fan cowling on. Now, as you can see, the whole fan assembly moves out of the way. You know, it's an old car, it's got an electric fan. So with an electric fan, it's a lot easier. You don't have to unbolt all that fan clutch. You just take this out of the way. Now, then we'll remove the other bolt that holds the other side of the radiator on. Kind of old and corroded. It's going to be kind of hard to get off. So push hard and then start it. Now it's going to come off. You don't want to strip it. Take it off, get it out of the way. Now the radiator seems to be sticking on the bottom. So let's get under here and check it out. A couple of bolts down here we gotta take off too. And while we're under here, we'll take this hose off, the bottom hose, so we can get it out easy. Then once it's loose, we can pull it off. Sometimes they stick on pretty hard. Eventually they'll pull off. Then we'll remove the cooling lines here. Pull them off to get enough room to pull out the radiator. That's an extra cooler here. Normally they're built into the radiator, but not on this one. So it actually makes this a somewhat easier job. Then out it comes. Fights it every inch. Then you get the new radiator. That goes over there, because the other one's on the bottom. Slide it in. Got to do a lot of wiggling here. Finally, it slides in. Now, before I forget, we'll put the mounts on. We want to make sure the mounts line up on both sides. Then we'll put the cooling hoses back on. And as usual, the one clamp's disappeared, so I have a box ready to put regular clamps on. They work better anyways. Then we'll stick the fan back on. As you can see here, it snaps in place. Then you bolt it on each side. Then we'll put the tank back in place. Bolt it on. Put the hose on. Then put the top radiator hose back on. We'll try the pliers this time. Getting it on is usually easier than getting it off. And it certainly was. And go back under the car. You don't want to forget the other hose. You'll have a giant mess. There's the hose. Goes right on there. And we'll put the clamp on. And on it goes. Nice and tight. And then we tighten the bolts on the bottom back up. Then comes the easy part. Fill it up with coolant. In this case, it's the old Ford coolant. We put in 50% coolant and 50% water. And start the vehicle up to warm it up. Half coolant, half water. This is the water hand. Now, unfortunately, as it's warming up, check it out. Bunch of smoke is coming out of the exhaust. 
As you can see, it has no tags, so I'm guessing that he drove it with a hole in the radiator, probably blew the head gasket. Only time will tell, but with this much smoke coming out, I'm guessing the head gasket's blown. Then you just pull it up to the top, put the cap back on, take off the prop rod, then pray the head gasket is not blown. Only time will tell on that one. So the next time your radiator craps out, why not replace it yourself? And save a ton of money. You might even get something from the aluminum that's in the radiator that you're throwing away. Let's start with the basic analysis of an overheating vehicle. And of course, the first thing to do is to check the coolant. If it's low on coolant, it could easily cause the problem at low speeds. It could not overheat at high speeds, but overheat at low speeds because as you're spinning the engine faster, the coolant goes through the system quicker. And even if you're a little low, it'll still work okay. But at idle, it won't. So, these crazy systems. The real radiator pressure cap is here. So first thing we do is take that off. You can see it's full inside. This cap is to check the radiator. As you can see, it's not a regular radiator cap. It doesn't have a spring or anything. It's just a cap. And as we see, it's pretty much full inside there, too. Now I asked the owner, has he had to add coolant to the system, antifreeze water mix? And he said no. We know it's not leaky. Normally, the next thing I'd do would be a pressure test of the coolant system with my pump system, but really, he said he's not losing any coolant. If you got a leak, you're gonna lose coolant. So the system's sealed. There's not a problem with that. And next, normally, I'd do one of these combustion leak tests where I'd put the blue liquid in here, run the engine, and see if the blue turns yellow showing that there's exhaust gas and the radiator showing a blown head gasket or cracked head. The car overheats with the AC on and idling for long periods of time. If it was a blowing head gasket, the faster you go, the worse it'll get. The faster you go, there's more pressure, the engine's spinning faster, it would build the exhaust gas up even faster and it would overheat worse at high speeds than at idle. So if it's a blown head gasket, it wouldn't have as much problem at idle, it would have a worse problem at high speed. And in this case, at high speed, it has no problem at all. So, we know it's not a blown head gasket. It would be much worse the faster you go. So something's up in the system that doesn't leak. Now, maybe it's a stuck thermostat. The thermostats when they're cold like this one, you can see it's stuck shut. As the engine heats up, it opens up and lets coolant from the radiator get into the engine to cool the engine. It's to warm them up faster. If it's stuck shut, it won't send any coolant to the engine from the radiator and it'll overheat, but when they're stuck shut, they overheat pretty fast, and then they just stay overheated. And again, same as if the head gasket was blown. If you have a stuck thermostat, it'll overheat at low speeds, but it will overheat even worse at high speeds because you need more coolant spinning through the fast spinning engine to dissipate all that heat from the engine running at higher RPMs. It would overheat like mad if it was stuck at high speeds, and in this case, at high speeds, it runs totally normal. What can it be? Well, it could be the fans aren't working right to cool the engine. So I'll start it up, turn the AC on, and we'll check the speed using our wind speed indicator. You can use your hand too, I mean. I can feel a lot of air coming out of here. Now this thing is rated at 5.68 miles per hour at idle. It's 5.67. That's certainly close enough. And really for those of you without one of these gauges, I mean you can get it for 25 bucks on Amazon, but what's your hand here? I feel a ton of air. That fan's blowing. But in this case, it's a mechanical fan. It runs off the water pump. Most vehicles these days have electric, one or two electric cooling fans instead of a mechanical one because they're more efficient, they work better. But you can test them the same way. Turn on the AC, make sure they're both blowing good. But in this case, I found out there's a flaw. The soldier who owns the car told me he was in a wreck and they didn't replace the condenser fan for the AC system. Supposed to be a cooling fan in here. And as you can see, there isn't one. It's gone. But when you look closely, there's a lot of bugs stuck in there. So we're gonna clean those off first. So out comes my unbeatable Honda powered pressure washer. It's a Honda, so you know it's gonna start. pressure washer and in this case we're losing a lower pressure nozzle you don't want too much pressure to clean all the bugs off and since it doesn't have the electric fan that goes on the condenser which pushes the air through the condenser to cool the AC and helps push air through the radiator which of course is behind the condenser and make it work so we're gonna hook this thing up right in front of the condenser then turn it on full blast we want it on high then we'll go inside the truck start it up 
the TAC on full blast. There it is, research. And we'll see what happens to the temperature gauge. The floor was going up all the way up to the notch that's under the H. Now it hasn't damaged anything yet because it has to get to the H when it boils, then it damages the engine. As long as it doesn't boil, it hasn't damaged the engine yet. So it hasn't done any damage. We're gonna let it sit for half an hour, 40 minutes, and check it every once in a while and see if it stays normal now. It sits so hot today, the end of July in Tennessee. I got a nice cool glass of water in a nice air-conditioned Nissan Titan and sit here for half an hour and watch it. Now, after 10 minutes, you can see it's still running good. Now, I can just about guarantee you that's the problem because it's logical. They didn't put the cooling fan for the condenser on after the wreck. It was designed that way. On the highway, yeah, you're going 60 miles an hour. You got 60 mile an hour wind, plenty enough to cool it off. But in the city, no. Especially when you're idling, it's gonna make it overheat, especially when you turn the AC on. The heat of the AC is ejected by the condenser that's in front of the radiator. So it puts a bunch of heat in front of the radiator. The condenser gets super hot. Then the air passes over the condenser and then, since it's in front of the radiator, that hotter air goes through the radiator. Well, that extra heat is going to make it not work right if there isn't more wind pushing it through. And of course, when you're going 60 miles an hour, you got 60 mile an hour wind going through the condenser, going through the radiator, cooling it off. But I still don't trust anything, so I'm going to wait half an hour to see if it changes. And in the meantime, I can see his tire pressure monitoring system light is on. There it is. So we might as well check that. I can't just sit here drinking water, cool off for half an hour. I'd be bored out of my mind. Here we go, plug in the scan tool. You need a decent one to do TPMS. The really cheap ones won't help. We'll plug it in. There we go. Now, unfortunately, even this scan tool won't do the TPMS, so I need a better one. What the heck? I like trying out scan tools, seeing what works and what doesn't. So, here's my new Think Car one that I've gotten recently. This new one is called Think Tool PD8. We'll see how it works. And it shows this doesn't do automatic detection in this particular model. They're blaming it on the manufacturer, so we'll have to put it in manually. We see the BCM has problems. It's got a code, four of them. They all say low voltage. Weak batteries often do that. Even with all this information, if you notice, there is not a tire pressure monitoring service information on this scan tool either. So we're going to do what I always have to do. I'm going to have to get the actual tire pressure monitoring computer to check it out a TPMS checker well there's a life of a mechanic for you now I got out here my Autel Max TPMS and it plugs in I always seem to get them upside down there we go that's plugged in now we'll see what this baby does here we go we want to check it out yes TPMS okay what do we got Nissan go up to Nissan diagnostics yes taking an awful lot of time the front left has low battery. The right rear has low battery. The right left has low battery. And there's no data from the front left. Now this is the problem with these stupid systems. Three of the four wheels have low voltage and one has none at all. Since the front left has no data at all, that means the front left sensor is either broken or its battery is completely dead. The other ones are warning that they're low. So here's how stupid it is. If you took it apart and replaced the front left one, the other three are low. They're gonna go out soon. They're all made at the same time, right? You'd have to replace all four. It costs a fortune. So I just say, get yourself a $10 little gauge to check your tire pressure with the tire pressure gauge. Fixing this is gonna cost a ton of money to fix it good. Cause if you change the front left, left one sure it'll start working but then the other three soon are going to go out because it says their batteries are low at least now you know how the stupid systems work that you're going to need a really specialized tool to check them not any even a good scan tool most of them won't even read them and i'll just live with this one well it's been about 40 minutes now messing with those things so let's check the overheating problem well as we look at the gauge it certainly is not overheating anymore so yeah putting this fan in front to take place of the condenser fan that isn't there from the wreck Next all problems. Now, the customer's a soldier. He's pinching pennies. So I told him, I ah, don't go by the super expensive Nissan fan. They want a ton for those things. Go to AutoZone O'Reilly, any discount auto parts store, and get an electric fan. Mount it there. Put a toggle switch in the dash. Put in a 20 amp fuse. You can turn it on when you want, when you're in traffic. Turn it off on a highway. Who knows? It was wrecked in the front. Maybe it even damaged the computer. You might buy a new fan and hook it up the way it was set up and it won't work. You just get a fan, they're less than a hundred bucks usually. Put a fan there, some wire, toggle switch and a fuse. Then you got simplicity itself. Or 
go buy all the Nissan parts and spend a fortune. It's your choice. At least you know how you can fix them now. So if you never want to miss another one of my new car repair videos, remember to ring that bell.